Good morning, Townsend Church. Let me begin by saying how proud we as the leadership of Townsend Church are of you. You guys are doing it. We are going into our third week of quarantine and you're doing very, very well. It may not feel like you're doing well. You may be going a little stir crazy at home, but you're doing well. We're proud of you. We're proud of you for staying in touch with your neighbors, with your friends. We're proud of you for going after God the way that you're going after God. And hopefully not only individually, but as you lead your family. But we're proud of you because you're doing the responsible thing. I know it's tough. I know it's not something we want to do. And really, for a lot of us, we don't like being told what to do and what not to do. But you're doing it. And we so appreciate your faithfulness in following the rules because really, in essence, you're following God. And so thank you for doing your part. Thank you for being the church to those that don't have a church. And so before we get into the message, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's see what he has for us this morning. Will you join me in prayer? God, I appreciate so much this different type of presentation. Or this is all new to us. This is different. We're not able to see each other face to face. But God, I don't want to focus on the things that are obvious to us. Lord, I want to focus on the things that aren't. And God, maybe it's not obvious to us the opportunity that lies in front of us to minister to our neighbors, to minister to our own family. God, this is an opportunity of a lifetime to allow you to flow through us to speak volumes of love and volumes of joy to those that don't normally get to hear it. Lord, you have created time for us to spend time with our neighbors more effectively and efficiently than we ever have, even though, again, it's six feet apart. But God, let this be a time of recognition of the opportunity to get alone with you, to allow our faith to be cultivated and to begin growing new crops that we may share with other people. May the fruit of the Spirit continue to exude from us the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May that continue to, to grow within us so that it can be fruit that can be shared. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity. Guide us now as we enter into your word and into these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anybody remember what last week's thought was? Does anybody remember? It has to do with our hope. That's right. Our hope is in God. It's not in the new vaccine that's coming out. It's not in necessarily the leaders, but our hope is in the greatest leader of all time who is still leading, and that is Jesus. That is where our hope lies. So they can quarantine us. They can can kick us out of our buildings and of our our, uh, workplaces, but they cannot kick Jesus out of our hearts and in the opportunity that we have of experiencing him the way that we get to. And so we are in the book of Matthew, so if you have your Bibles or if you have your phone, I want you to open that up, and we're going to be in Matthew chapter 12. We're going to be reading quite a few verses today, um, but they kind of coincide, they go together, and so that's why we're going to couple them together. But Matthew chapter 12 is where we're going to be. And while you're turning there, I want you to be thinking about this question, what is most important? Now, if you're answering the question for me, you're probably thinking, well, Toyota Tacoma and golf is all that he really ever talks about. So that's probably really what's most important. Well, those are important to me, but so is my family. My family is far more important to me than golf or uh, the Toyota Tacoma. My church family is important to me, but you know what is really important to me? My faith. My faith in Christ is so important to me. But normally when we ask people that type of question, what is most important? Faith is kind of a Sunday school answer, and that's really not the first thing that comes to mind unless we are answering in church. But here are some things that you may not be thinking about. Being right, that's kind of important to us. We want to be right. In fact, deep within us, there's kind of a need to be right. 
that's something that we all struggle with. We want to be right. We want to be heard. We want to be understood. We want our ideas to be used. In fact, it goes a little deeper. In fact, most of us want to be recognized. That's important to us. We want that pat on the back. We want that, that promotion. We want that next level recognition. It's why we work so hard. It's why we, we play so hard. It's why we try to have that next best thing because we want to be recognized as somebody that has things, somebody that's arrived, somebody that's got it all put together. So we struggle with the importance of wanting to be right and wanting to be recognized, and those are deep within our hearts. But something that I believe is even more important that we place a lot of importance on is being valued. We want to be valued. We want our life to matter. We want our life to be recognized. We want in our life to have some semblance of, hey, we did that right. Those are important to us. Now, if you notice, we kind of shifted from the ethereal things of life that don't really matter too much because a lot of times the world puts important on those things like money, stuff, things like that. But we're changing the game. We're going in a different direction. We're trying to look at this thing from a spiritual standpoint of what's most important deep within us. And those three things right there are deep within us. We want to be right. We want to be recognized and we want to be valued. But this morning, I want to challenge that thought. What if there's something more important? Now, we're going to go a little Sunday school on this answer, but then we're going to morph it into something deeper. So the Sunday school answer, first and foremost, would always be, we just, we want to love God. That's what's most important to me. And that is a true statement. And it should be what's most important to you. We should love God with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our mind. That's what's important. But what if it's deeper than that? What if it's, we should love God so that? Now you're probably thinking, well, what, what are you getting at? Well, what if I can love God so much that it affects me to live differently? I want to love God in such a way and understand him in such a way that because of who he is and what he's trying to do and who I can be in him, it will propel me into living differently. What if what's most important to me is that I love God so that we can love others? What well, you're probably thinking, but I do love others. Well, do you? Do you love others the way that God loves them? <clears throat> or do you love them so that they'll hear you so maybe they'll think you're right? Or do you love them so that you can be recognized? Or do you love them so that they can show value in your life? You see, love can be tricky. <clears throat> love can be really about us. But when we love God, there's something about loving God that gives us an understanding not only of who He is, but who we are in Him. And when we can see who we are in Him because of our love for Him, it will now allow us to see people how He sees people, which will open the door for us to love them in the way that He loves them. And so for me today, I want to love God so that I can know how to love others. Because sometimes I don't do that very well. That is hard for me because I get stuck in the idea of I want to be right. Or I, want to, I get stuck in the idea of, well, I want the recognition. Or I get stuck in the idea of, well, they don't value me. As important as those things are, this is far more important. I want to love God in such a way that I can know how to love others best. And as we get into the story today, I believe that's kind of what the Pharisees are stuck on. Now, again, we've kind of had this notion that Jesus did a lot of teaching right up front, right off the bat from the Sermon on the Mount, but then he transitioned straight into meeting the needs of the people, of just healing them. And now he's kind of transitioning into a healing and teaching at the same time, but he teaches first and then he heals. And then he gets into teaching for the sake of healing our spiritual well-being. And that'll be later on in the book of Matthew. But let's turn to Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to read 1 through 13. Now again, 
<coughs> a little bit more verses than normally we would read. However, today, these two stories go hand in hand. <clears throat> They're kind of in the same boat. And so let's jump to Matthew chapter 12 and let's see what God has for us this morning. Verse 1 says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So here, here's the idea. Jesus and his guys are, are walking through these grain fields, and the grain fields are ripe. They are ready to be picked. They are ready to be harvested. <clears throat> and his disciples are hungry. Jesus was hungry. But his disciples were the ones who plucked the grain heads, rubbed it in between their hands to get rid of the husks and all the stuff that was with that, to get to the grain and just ate it as a snack. They just wanted a, a little bite to eat. And the Pharisees flipped out. They're like, look, here's your disciples. You're supposed to be this special guy, and your own followers can't even follow the rules. They're breaking the rules. Now, in the laws, there were lots of laws that there was some provision that you could do certain things on those days. But getting grain and breaking out the husks and harvesting that way, that was a no-no. And so the Pharisees are figuring out any possible way that they can to bust Jesus. And he starts with busting his disciples. <clears throat> but then he says to them in verse 3, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. So Jesus goes back to old times. He says, okay, wait a second. You guys study the law. You know the law inside and out. Do you not remember this story about David? When David was on the run from Saul right after uh, he and Jonathan had that very special uh, moment in time, and then they split, and he ends up at the, the priest, and he says, hey, I'm hungry, and I know you've got some showbread in there. Give me five loaves so that me and my guys can eat because we're hungry. <clears throat> and Jesus says, don't you remember that story? You know that the law says that that showbread that's sitting there is to only be used for the priests. Once it is done being in the presentation mode, it is taken out and given to the priests to eat. Only for the priests. And David went and asked for that and received five loaves. So he's kind of putting it back on the Pharisees and saying, hey, what do you do with that? Is that not okay? And then he goes a step further. Now he's really getting into, into the thick of things. He says in verse 5, Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? What is he talking about? Well, remember, the Sabbath was nobody works. <clears throat> nobody does anything out of the ordinary. Yeah, anything out of the ordinary. Like, you're just supposed to do nothing. But the priests, they had sacrifices they had to make. In fact, they had more than the normal sacrifices. They had to kill the animal, drain the animal, fix the animal, burn the animal, make the fire. They had lots of things. And Jesus says, hey, wait, don't you see and remember in the laws that you've studied and the laws that you know that these guys worked on the Sabbath? They worked on their day off, and yet they were held blameless because it was something that was necessary. It wasn't about the law. It was about what is necessary. And then Jesus goes another step. He says in verse 6, Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. There's one greater than the temple. He's referring to himself. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus pulls out all stops. He pulls out David, one of the greatest kings in history, one of the men that just was a man after God's own heart, and they knew that. And yet David, out of necessity, did what he needed to do. And then the priests, the very ones that they know the law, broke the law because it was necessary, but they were held blameless. And then he says, if you had known and studied what I asked you to study, do you remember back in the Sermon on the Mount where he challenged them? Go back and what does the law say? Go study it for yourself. 
And he basically calls them out. If you had really gone back and looked at that and understood it, you would know that what these guys are doing right here is necessary and fine because I am not confined by the Sabbath. That's interesting. What a great statement. Then he goes on, the story continues in verse 9. He says, Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. And behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Now in Mark's recollection of this gospel in chapter 3, it's a little bit different. In fact, when he goes in, <clears throat> Jesus asks the question. Let me, I'm going to turn over there so you can hear the question that he asks because it's pretty Pretty valid and pretty important. Now, you might be thinking, well, does that mean that the Bible is wrong because there's two different things? No, remember, these are two different accounts written by two, or the same account written by two different people. So you're going to get a little bit of variation in the story depending on the perspective. But the crux of the story is still the same. Here's what he says. He asks the group, he asks that man to step forward, and he asks the group, he says, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do, e to do evil, to save life or to kill? So in this process of trying to heal this man, he asks the crowd a question. Is it better to do good or evil on the Sabbath? Is it better to save a life or to kill a life on the Sabbath? And in Mark's gospel, he says, nobody says a word. Everybody is silent because he knew that he had them. The obvious answer is it's better always to do good than to do evil. It's always better to save a life than to kill a life. And so he says, What man is there among you who has one sheep? In verse, we're back in Matthew chapter 12, verse 11. He says, And what man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out. Or how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So Jesus basically says, okay, he's kind of, <clears throat> maybe Matthew holds the question and Mark just gives the, the general idea of the question. <clears throat> but here's what Jesus says. He says, let me ask you guys a question. If any of you, he's talking to the Pharisees and anybody else that's listening. If any of you find a sheep of yours down into a crack or a crevice, how many of you are going to waste no time and figure out how to get that sheep out? You're going, to, you're going to work to get that sheep out. And then he says, is not this man's life more valuable than a sheep? Now you've got to remember, this man has an issue with his hand. And maybe I forgot to tell you that. But this man has an issue with his hand. It's a, a hand that has palsy and maybe it's, it's gnarled up. Maybe he can't use it. Maybe it's st uh, stiff to the side. Who knows what is going on? But there's a problem with his hand. And Jesus asks him to reach out his hand. <clears throat> so he says to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and is restored as whole as the other. Wow, what a story. And Jesus, as he's getting ready to heal this man, is teaching a very strong lesson. He's challenging the very Pharisees and the very laws that they are debating over constantly. But they are more worried about the laws than they are about people. This poor man is most likely a social outcast because of his hand. He's most likely downtrodden because of sin in his life that caused it, when it may not be sin at all. It may just be the lot that was given to him in his life. Jesus asked the question, what's more important, to do good or to do evil on the Sabbath? There's so much in this story. So let's get into it, pick it apart, and see excuse me, what we can get out of it. Here's a couple of things I want you to see right off the bat. Wherever Jesus was, so were his disciples. Now that's generally speaking, meaning wherever Jesus went, it's most likely his disciples were there. It's very rare that we find Jesus anywhere without one or two or all of his disciples. <clears throat> Those guys followed him all the time. And so Jesus is now out in the field and his disciples are there. Now, it's interesting that his disciples ate and Jesus didn't. And it could be that Jesus just had self-control. Maybe his disciples are still new in all of this. And Jesus knew that this was going to cause issue, but it was necessary and he could wait the disciples couldn't, and so they ate. And so one of the things that I think is important for us is that wherever God or wherever Jesus was, his disciples followed him. And so the thought, 
hit me from a Bible study that I did years ago, changed my life. And it was experiencing God. I did it as a, a, a young adult. And here's one of the thoughts that has always stuck with me. See where God is at work and go join him. Now that's a paraphrase from me, but it's the general principle and idea that Henry Blackaby came up with, uh, with his other writer friends out of experiencing God. He said, see where God is at work and you go join him. Stop waiting for God to come to you. Stop <laughs> asking God to do for you what he's already doing elsewhere and go join him. God is not at our beck and call. We are to see where he is at work and go join him. The invitation is always there for us. We should go join him. And that is what the disciples are doing. They're following Jesus around wherever he's going and getting involved. But most of the time when we see people are uh, flocking after Jesus, but for the wrong reasons. And so let me ask you this question. If we are to see where God is at work and go join him, where are we in relation to where God is working? God is at work all the time. Maybe he's at work with your coworkers at work. Maybe you need to join his work there and go after them. We know he's at work at our church. Maybe it's time you get involved with the work of God instead of doing it how you want to do it or only doing things that you like to do. Why not say, God, I am here. Use me. Where are we in relation to where God is? is working. How often have we said, God, I know you can use me, use me. A lot of times we put stipulations on it. God, I will only you be used by you if you do it this way and this way, or if I can only be in this job. Truth of the matter is, God just wants us to be submissive. God wants us to submit all that we have for him to use as he sees fit. Now, when we think about this and we think about the Pharisees, the Pharisees were absolutely in direct opposition to this. They didn't care about that. They wanted God to come to them. They wanted God to do it how they wanted to do it. They were too busy debating the law and having factions within themselves because they couldn't even interpret it themselves. Constantly arguing back and forth. But with their direct opposition and their de constant debating about Maybe it was carpet color. Maybe it was over the chandeliers. Maybe it was over silly things that didn't need to be debated about. They lost sight of what was most important, and that was the people. They lost sight of the people and the authority of God. Maybe we should be quicker to recognize the authority of God. The Pharisees who knew the law inside and out should have instantly known that Jesus was the Son of God, but they didn't. Why? because they were more focused on the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law was to protect the people. They used it to oppress the people. They used it to their own benefit. They sat up on their high and mighty chairs and oppressed the people with these laws that they weren't even willing to follow most of the time themselves. We should be quick to recognize the authority of God. We should be quick to recognize who God is and where he's at work, but we can only do that if we know him the way that he is to be known. Let me give you an example. This came up in our, our Bible study uh, a couple of days ago when we were preparing for our sermon. Think about Abraham. <clears throat> Abraham was given the one thing that he was waiting for forever, and that was a son. And God had promised him this son and really we're going to make a great nation because of this son. And Abraham was so excited. He had everything that he ever wanted. God had visited with them and, and given them what they had asked for. And then God came back and said, if you trust me, give me your son back. But you know what? Abraham didn't hesitate. He didn't worry about what his wife was going to say. He didn't worry about what his kid was going to say. He didn't worry about what his helpers were going to say. He didn't worry about anything else. He recognized the authority of God and marched up that mountain with his son, laid his son on the altar, and decided, if this is God's will, I will follow it. Either God will save him, either God will raise him from the dead, or he will provide another source. But God is the authority of my life. I'm not going to debate with him. I'm not going to argue with him. I'm going to follow him in full submission. And that, my friends, is what the Pharisees were lacking. They were in direct opposition of that. And sometimes we have to ask ourselves, why are we not growing? Why are we not experiencing God to the fullest? It could be because we're in direct opposition of what he's calling us to do. He is calling for full submission. 
He is calling for us to recognize the authority of who He is. He is calling us to see Him for who He is so that we can love others and see others the way that He sees them. I find it interesting, this thought that the Pharisees had more concern for following the law than for meeting the needs. They had more concern with doing the law than being the law. They were more concerned about not committing murder rather than being a person of love and not murdering in their heart. They had far more concern with following the law than meeting the needs. Jesus was there to meet needs and to fulfill the law. They felt like he should have been there to carry out the law and forget the people because that's what they did. But what needs are we talking about? What needs were they forgetting? Well, there were two needs that Jesus addresses in his actions here. In Matthew's recording, the two needs that we see are the needs of necessity. These dudes were hungry. The disciples needed to eat. David needed to eat. And so the needs of necessity, the, the priests, they have to commit these, um, or to, to do the sacrifices. They had to do that. It was, they were needs of necessity. The law gets trumped. There were needs of necessity of doing what is right and what was necessary in the moment. It doesn't take away from the law, but it's the necessary needs of the moment. And then mercy. This gentleman needed mercy. He couldn't take care of himself. He couldn't do anything with his hand. And Jesus showed him mercy. Probably why all the Pharisees showed him the opposite of that. The needs that are being met are needs of necessity and needs of mercy. And the law can do that just in a different way. And here's the contradiction. When Jesus asked them, what would you do if your sheep was in a crack in the ground or in a pit? They knew the answer. They would do good. They would get that sheep out. They would break the law out of necessity. because it was necessary and yet they wanted to point fingers and to point at people that needed to be loved rather than held accountable to the law and so we see these things because the law is important and Jesus wanted to fulfill the law in a different manner than the way that the Pharisees were trying to do it so They help themselves by helping the sheep. You see, fulfilling the law and breaking the law the way that they wanted to do it was only about helping themselves. But really, what should be done is helping others require them to live appropriately. If they really wanted to help others, now they're going to have to live by the law as well. Again, these Pharisees didn't always live by the law. They lived by the laws that was comfortable to them and how they interpreted the laws rather than asking God how he wanted them interpreted. Rather than seeking out true understanding and coming to a common place and living by how the scripture that they had in front of them asked them to live. Helping others require them to live appropriately. Now, I find that, again, interesting to myself because if I'm to help you, if I'm to help my neighbor, if I'm to help my family, I've got to live out what I'm asking you to do first. I can't require you to live something that I can't even live myself. And yet for these Pharisees, they only did things that would help themselves. They did not want to do things in order to help other people, yet Jesus did that. Jesus lived life in such a way that helped others out. He showed them mercy, not only by physically showing them mercy, but by living a life of mercy in front of them. I think Paul says it best in Philippians 2, 4. He says, let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. The Pharisees didn't do a very good job of this, but Jesus did an excellent job of this. In this entire story, we see him living out, looking out for the needs of other people. And he still is doing that today through his spirit that lives within us. He's looking out for our needs as he throws up those red flags of, hey, don't do that. Hey, don't go there. Hey, don't say that. Don't think this way. That's what he wants for us. He wants to show us mercy and kindness and free us from the oppression of the law, but allow us to live in the spirit of the law in order to 
uh, accomplish everything that he's called us to accomplish. John 13, 35, Jesus says it again. By this, we'll, uh, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. <clears throat> that verse does not say by this all will know that you are my disciples if you keep the law perfectly. It says if you have love one for another. But if I have love for you, I'm not going to kill you. If I have love for you, I'm not going to cheat on my wife with your wife. If I have love for you, I'm not going to break the laws because I want to treat you with kindness and with mercy. And I want to do what is necessary in my life to honor God. That helps me understand that when I can love God effectively and efficiently, then I know how to love and serve others correctly. What an interesting comment. What an interesting thought that Jesus is trying to help these Pharisees to see that, great, I'm glad you know the law, but live it out. Show mercy. Do the things that are necessary. And don't be so oppressive with this thing. Think of people as you think of me. So here's the thought that we can be considering and mulling over over the next week. The church is positioned as the Pharisees were to advance the kingdom. We are positioned in such a way that we can advance the kingdom just as the Pharisees did. The Pharisees knew the law. They had the law. And they should have been advancing the kingdom of God by preaching it correctly and living it out correctly. But they weren't. They were using it as self-serving laws. But we have the law too. The law to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The law to love our neighbor as ourselves. Those are the laws that we have in front of us and that we should be living out. And we, as the Pharisees, are positioned as the church to advance the kingdom. And let me remind you, the crowds are still watching. The crowds that watched the Pharisees, the crowds that watched Jesus, the crowds that watched Paul, the crowds that watched the disciples, the crowds that have watched Billy Graham, the crowds that have watched all of the men that have gone on before us are still watching us. And they are watching to see how we're going to love God first in order to love them next. So what should our concern be for? Our concern should be for spiritual growth. Our concern, especially in the time that we have allotted for us, should be for our own spiritual growth so that we can encourage spiritual growth for other people. Our spiritual growth should be the first thing that is on our mind when we wake up, the last thing on our mind when we go to sleep, and on our mind all day. God, how can I use and leverage this opportunity to grow spiritually? God, this thing that's coming up in my life, how can I grow spiritually from it? God, I know that I'm, I'm not sure what's coming ahead of me yet, but I know that I need to be growing and preparing for whatever that is. That should be the most important concern for us. But not only for ourselves, but so that we can be uh, encouraging others to spiritually grow as well, so that we can be prepared to answer questions and to move people forward and to advance the kingdom. But not only should our concern for, be for spiritual growth, but our concern um, for um, serving others. Well, that didn't work out quite how I'd hoped it would. I was looking at the wrong slide. So we've got concern for spiritual growth and concern for serving others. Our concern for serving others and our concern for spiritual growth, they go together. In order for me to serve effectively and efficiently God and others, I've got to grow spiritually. I've got to understand Him. And the more that I understand Him, the more that I will understand myself so that I can see them the way that he sees them. I want to refer back to another quote by Henry Blackaby. He says, Rather than focusing on what our church is doing for us, we ought to be asking what God is seeking to do in our church through us. Now, obviously, he is talking about the local church, Townsend Church. We shouldn't be coming in and saying, Okay, give me what I need. We should be entering in saying, how can I give back? What can I do in my church today? But I also think that, <coughs> excuse me, the global church is what it's talking about as well. What can the global church do for me? No, no, no. What can I do for the global church? What can I do to advance the kingdom of God, to advance the church by 
talking to my neighbors, by talking to my coworkers, by talking to my family, by talking to the people at Walmart. What can I do to advance the kingdom? You see, Jesus took the opportunity to challenge these Pharisees because the Pharisees were living in such a way that they were all about themselves and not thinking about the people, and they were the ones that had the law. Let's not be the Pharisee. Let's be different than the Pharisee. Let's get to know God in such a way that will allow us not only to love Him, but to love others effectively and efficiently. Let's get into a place where we are not like the Pharisees of just knowing all the laws, but let's start living out the law of loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, of loving our neighbor as ourselves, so that we can be the church and advance the kingdom of God. What do you say, church? Can we do that? Absolutely, we can. We can love God so that we can love others. Our prayer for you this week is that you spend time with God in learning how to love Him again, not as the Pharisees did, but in the way that He wants to be loved, the way that He allows us to love Him, and the way that we can love Him, so that we can be effective in advancing the cause of the church, advancing the name of Jesus, and how we love others. But in order to love others, we've got to know how to love God first. Let me pray for you this morning. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for who you are. God, I pray that you would take this video, allow it to be all that it needs to be. God, I ask that in our homes, in our minds, wherever we're listening and and watching this, that you would challenge our hearts in the areas that we're being pharisaical, that we're saying one thing and doing another just like they did. God, reveal those areas in our life so that we can submit them to you and use those areas to love you effectively and efficiently so that we can love others as well. May you be glorified in all things. May your word continue to go forth. May you do great and mighty works, not only in our church, but in the global church and in our homes and in our neighborhoods as we are there now. We love you. We praise you and thank you for being such a great God. Be with those that need you most right here, right now. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church. Be looking for our announcement videos. Uh, There are things on Facebook that you can be watching as well and listening to and reading. I know Pastor Charlie's been uh, pinning some things down uh, on a blog that helps us kind of learn how to deal with anxiety and fear. Uh, It's been very good writing, and I would encourage you to go look at that. Uh, Don't forget Wednesday nights. We've got Bible studies that are going live on YouTube. I know the kids are doing uh, Zoom meetings. Um, There's lots of things that are going on and trying to keep us all connected. But most importantly, we want you to stay connected with our Heavenly Father. He is the one that matters most, and He is the one that we should love first. God bless you. Have a great day.